All right, let's get started. So today we're going to continue talking about um, Markov decision processes, what they are and how to solve them. And if you remember, we had a big running example, which was Grid World. Uh, you'll also see Grid World in your project threes. In Grid World, it's kind of like being a maze, right? So you have an agent in uh, a rectangular grid, and there are walls just like in a maze, so you can't move into a square that's occupied by a wall. The new thing in Grid World, as opposed to, say, the Pac-Man maze from the earlier projects, is that when you attempt to move, for example, if you choose the action north, you may or may not actually move to the square that is north of you. So 80% of the time, in this particular grid world, the action north takes you north. 10% of the time, it takes you west. 10% of the time, it takes you east. And in general, you've got a 10% chance of going uh, 90 degrees in the wrong direction. There's also a kind of bounce rule that says if the uh, direction you would have gone has a wall, then you just stay put. So in search, we not only had uh, we, not, we not only had states and successors, we also had costs. And in general, we were looking for a solution of minimum cost. Here, the analog to costs are rewards, and we're looking for a solution, um, whatever form that's going to take, of maximum rewards. So in this particular grid world, the way the rewards work is that if you get to the gem and then you exit the maze from there, you get a plus one. If you get to the fiery pit, you get a minus one when you exit from there. And every other step, that you take that isn't an exit from one of those two squares incurs what's called a living reward. The living reward could be zero, it could be a little bit positive, it could be a little bit negative, and the big rewards come at the end. Okay, so that's grid world. And in grid world, you're trying to maximize the sum of rewards, and as we talked about last time, often instead of just summing up the rewards, we sum them up discounted, which means every time step, the numbers are worth a multiplicative factor that we call gamma less. Okay, there are many MDPs in the world, Grid world is just one of them. So the concept of bouncing off a wall, that's unique to grid world. The concept of a living reward, that's unique to grid world. Remember, there was also a racing example that didn't have walls and living rewards. It had car temperatures and speeds and things like that. So in general, we're talking about Markov decision processes, which are just non-deterministic search problems. And grid world is one of them, OK? Any MDP is going to have a set of states, just like a search problem. It's going to have a set of actions, just like a search problem. And it's going to have a set of transitions. And here's where we have a difference from standard search formulation. In search, when you take an action from a state, it has a single result S prime. So if you're in state S and you choose action A, you know what's going to happen. It's S prime. And that which S prime is told to you by the successor function. In an MDP, when you take an action A from a state S, who knows what might happen? There's a set of possible outcomes S prime. And the distribution over those is given by the transition function. There's also rewards. So for any particular transition you undergo, so if you're in state S, you choose action A, and S prime is the, play, is the state that you land in, there's going to be a reward SAS prime, R of SAS prime, that is your instantaneous reward for that time step. And in general, we want to sum those up possibly with a discount. So, so far we know about several quantities. We know what a policy is. So because in an MDP, even if you know the policy, even if you know what um, action you're going to take from each state, you don't know the result of your action, right? Um, because of that, we don't have solutions. We don't have a sequence of actions that's guaranteed to work in a general MDP. Instead, solving an MDP involves computing a policy, which is a map from states to actions. Okay, so there's good policies and bad policies. One way to characterize a state is by talking about its utility. Okay, so what's the utility of a state? Of course it's going to depend what you do, right? If you act poorly, you're not going to get many points. So we talked about one important kind of utility so far, which is the Expectamax utility. And in general, when you talk about um, the Expectamax utility of a state, we call that the value. So if somebody just says value and they don't specify anything else, they mean the optimal Expectamax value. So the value of a state is the expected future utility from that state. The utility is the sum of the discounted rewards. You won't know what utility you get until you actually act, right? And, but we can talk about the expected utility, the average you would get if you average out all of the things that might happen. So values, if you think about an Expectamax tree like this, values are what you get when you launch an Expectamax search from a state. We also gave chance nodes, as they used to be called, a new name. So chance nodes correspond to a state and a selected action. What's the chance about? It's about the outcome of the action. 
Okay, so one of these nodes, SA, these are called Q states. Right, it's not the best name ever. So when you hear Q state, don't worry about why is it a Q or just rem remember that a Q state is a chance node. It's a state action pair. And they have values too. And those are called Q values. So if we talk about the value of a Q state, it's what you would get if you acted optimally from that Q state, which is really just what you would get if you launched expect a max search from a chance node. Right? It's still defined. You just start with your first recursion being an average instead of your first recursion being a sum. I'm sorry, a max. Okay, any questions on the recap? So that's MDPs. And we've, we spent the last lecture talking about these optimal quantities. So we talked about the value of a state being the optimal value. That means what you should get on average if you act optimally. Okay, and the value of a Q state was the optimal value of that Q state. And similarly, when we talked about policies, we talked about the optimal policies. And we're gonna talk a little bit about optimal things still today, but today we're gonna start to have the notion of evaluating values for policies that aren't optimal, and then we'll see why we might wanna do that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a look at a demo to make this concrete. Okay, so if you remember, here is that uh, grid, this is a grid from the book, and it's the grid with the plus one and minus one rewards. And what you can see has been filled in here is for each square, it's showing the value of that square. So what's the value mean? Again, that's the expected discounted sum of rewards if you start in that state and then act optimally. So of course, if you start in the exit state, acting optimally is the same as acting any other way. All you can do is choose exit and you'll get a one, here you'll get a minus one. From down here in 0.28, uh, uh, in this square, you'll get a lower uh, reward because either there's a living reward that's chipping away at your score, or maybe there's a discount. I would have to tell you the, the specific parameters of this MDP. But what can you see here? The numbers, that's the value. So of course, being at the exit, the good exit, is better than being down here in the corner, um, but being down here in the corner is better than being in the pit of death, okay? So that's values, those are those numbers. What are Q values? A value is a property of a state. Right? And of course you can do dumb things from a state. The value is what you get if you act optimally. Q values are a property of a state and an action. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split each of these states into four, right? It's four because from each state there are four actions. So if you look at uh, the upper right corner here, there's only one action, it's called exit. And so here there's only one Q value, right? And it's gonna be one. But the interesting state, let's, uh, let's look at this one that used to be uh, just marked with the number 0.28 down here in the lower right, right? If I am in that state and I go to the left, then if I act optimally thereafter, I will get 0.28. That was the value of the state, so this must be the optimal action. But of course, there's also the Q state that corresponds to being in the lower right and moving north, or rather selecting the action north. And that one, the Q value isn't very good because most of the time you fall into the pit. Okay, so for each state, there's one value, but for each action from a state, there is a Q value. One other thing in that demo to look at is these, these uh, triangles, and these triangles indicate the policy. So it turns out that if you follow these arrows, you will get on average 0.28 from the lower right. Okay, if you do something else, like always dive bomb the fiery pit, you'll probably won't get 0.28. Okay. So values are always with respect to a policy, but when we don't specify a policy, we mean optimal values, which means the optimal policy. Okay, so we also talked about something called the Bellman equations, and we're gonna look at those again in a little more detail today, because they're really the foundation, not only of all the algorithms for solving MDPs, they're also the foundation for the algorithms we're gonna see next week for doing reinforcement learning. So let's make sure the Bellman equations are super clear. Really, these whole four lectures are built on these same set of equations. So, the Bellman equations basically say, how should you, what does it mean to act optimally, right? Because we're talking about the value under optimal action. What does that mean? Well, in essence, we break it into a recursion. We say step one, you have to do the right thing for the first step. And then thereafter, you have must continue being optimal. Now, continuing being optimal, that's essentially, it's like a recursion. That's the thing we were trying to compute to begin with. And so when we write down these equations, they're, they're gonna be a system of equations. They're gonna define the optimal values in terms of other optimal values one step ahead in the computation, okay? So, we can define our optimal utility using these same expectamax ideas. That's why these expectamax trees are kind of stalking us. They keep showing up on every slide because each one of these ideas is essentially a reformulation of some variant of expectamax. 
So for example, we can say, um, we want to compute values and Q values. So values are the value, uh, my ink go. So the value, and we'll put a star here to mean optimal, of a state, it's what you would get if you did an infinite depth expectamax. Now we're not going to write down an equation for an infinite depth expectamax, but we're just going to expand out as little as possible until we can plug in some other quantity that we can define recursively. So what's the expectamax value at a max node? So that's at some state s. Well, you would just take a maximum over all the children a, right? That's all the actions you can take. And then it would be the value of the chance node below it. And we know that chance node's values have a name. They're called q values. So that's for a state action pair. And so the value is just the maximum over all of the q values that are below it. OK, that's easy enough, right? Um, the interesting one is, well, what's a q value, right? That system, this, equation, this set of equations isn't complete yet because it doesn't get back to v. So what is the value at a chance node sa? Well, it's going to depend on all of the s primes that might result from that state action pair. So it's going to depend in grid world on all of the squares I could land if I chose to go north. And in that case, there'd only be like three options. So what do we do at a chance node? We take an average. Well, we'll come back to the average for a second. But remember, um, what happens in terms of an MDP, in terms of the rewards, if, is if I go down this path, right? The, I select action A, and then something S prime happens, I get a reward. The reward I get is instantaneous. I get R, S, A, S prime right then. So I get minus one right that instant because I just exited the pit. Or I get a zero because I just went from a boring square to another boring square. So I get an instantaneous reward. And my total rewards are the instantaneous rewards I got that time step, plus all the rewards I get in the future. Well, what are those? They're going to be from S prime. And if I act optimally from S, it means that whenever I land in an S prime, I have to act optimally from there as well. Prime, OK. Um, so the rewards I get in the future are going to be the value of the landing state S prime. OK, now we have to go back to the fine print. We know that um, we don't know what S prime I'm going to land at, so I have to take an average over all the possible S primes. The probability of each S prime is given by the transition function. So this sum over t. That's the average of the s primes. OK, so here we almost have it. We almost have the q stars. That's the value of a chance node defined in terms of the values of the children, plus that one step r. OK, there's one thing missing. What's missing? There needs to be a gamma, right? And that's because whatever happens when we land an s prime, right, will be optimal, but will also be one step in the future, which means whatever value we get back is worth gamma less than it would have been worth to us right now. So that's it. This is value uh, uh, in terms of q value, in other words, max node in terms of chance node, and here's chance node in terms of max node, q value in terms of value. And of course, I can inline these if I don't like the q value. So you know, if, you're, if you're offended by q values, and you know, q values aren't for everybody, but uh, if you don't like them, then you can just inline them away. And now you have um, a much larger equation, but that just directly defines values in terms of values. And so even though this is larger, and q values will be extremely important next week, people often cite the Bellman equation in this form, values in terms of values one step ahead. right? And that idea of one step ahead is this is the value of a state, and it's defined in terms of what happens in one step, right? plugging in the future. right? This is the future here. But it's the future one step away and thereafter. Okay. So these are called one step look aheads, because they unroll one layer of expectamax. Any questions on Bellman equations? OK, so these are Bellman equations. And what they do is they characterize the optimal values. So let's think about what that means. Um, when I write down that system of equations, right? so here it is. I've gotten rid of the Qs for the moment. That V stars are on the left, and they're on the right. So this doesn't tell me how to find the V stars. It just gives me a set of equations whose solutions are the optimal values. Because whatever the values are, they behave according to this one step look ahead expect a max recurrence. Now the question is, since I don't know the ones on the right, how do I find the ones on the left? And at the end of last class, we saw an algorithm called value iteration, which we'll extend today. And the idea behind value iteration is you kind of, you, you in, instead of having this be um, a system of equations, you turn it into updates. So what you do is you say, all right, let's imagine that the thing on the right is a different thing. So the thing on the right, the v's on the right, those are going to be vk for some previous iteration. So you start off with v0 is a vector of zeros. All right, 
And then you say, because we know the ones on the right, we can now compute the ones on the left. Well, if the ones on the right were wrong, then the ones on the left are going to be wrong too. But in some sense, they're going to be a little bit better, because whatever was wrong has just been multiplied by a factor less than one. So it's less wrong, right? And this one step was correct, because we actually did one layer of expectance. And that's the idea here, is you start with something that's wrong, it's just a vector of zeros, and you refine it level by level until you find a fixed point to this update. So um, even though we talked about this like a kind of very specialized algorithm, really if you zoom out, we're just saying here's a system of equations, we'd like to find a solution. One general way of finding a solution for especially equations like this that aren't linear is to use some kind of fixed point solution algorithm. This is a fixed point solution. We also saw last time that the vector v sub k, we could think of it as an approximate value to the optimal value. So we could think as k goes to infinity, these approach the optimal values. Or you can actually think of it having meaning. So v sub 7 is the optimal value if there are only seven time steps left. So you can either think of the vk having its own semantics, or you can think of them as just being an intermediate computation that slowly converges, or hopefully not so slowly, uh, but eventually converges to the true value. Yes. Right, so that, it's a great question about the fine print and grid world. And as you start your project threes, um, you will care a lot about this. So let me just rerun that demo. Okay, so what's going on here? This value one, right, if, if from that state your future value is one, it means you haven't picked up the gem yet, right? You pick up the gem from that upper right corner when you choose the value exit. So you imagine, you know, from that, you call exit, the helicopter comes and gets you, and as you board the helicopter, you get your reward. So getting to that state isn't what gives you the one. It's leaving that state. Where do you go? You go to some mystery state that isn't shown in the GUI. Great point. Sure. Uh, other questions on this demo before I make it go away? Bye-bye demo. All right, here's the difference. Um, when I write down this system of equations, okay, there's maxes, there's sums, there's t's, but really you could plug in numbers, right? R of SAS prime for this state and this action is like 0.3 or something, right? So I could plug in all the numbers. And if I plugged in all the numbers, this would just be a bunch of equations that have a bunch of variables in them. What are the variables? They're the different vs's for the different s's. So I have, um, I have one of these equations for each state. Right? And the variables are one variable for each state. So I have a system of equations. I've got enough equations, right? So, you know, modulo fine print, there should be a solution to this. But I don't know how to find it, right? Writing down a system of equations doesn't give me a solution. This is an update, right? So actually, this equal sign up here, right? You all know this from, from learning to code. Um, this equal sign, uh, this is an assertion here, and this is an assignment, right? So it turns out that when you just do the assignment over and over again, you converge to a solution. That's not always true for every kind of equation, but it is true here. Other questions? Okay. Um, okay, convergence. There's an asterisk here, and it will always mean the same thing in this course. It means you are responsible for knowing the ideas on this slide, but you're not responsible for kind of recreating this proof on the fly or anything like that in as much depth as we would expect for an, uh, the normal material. So. We have these vectors. They start out at zero. I do an update. Now they're maybe not zero anymore. And I do an update, and I do an update. Uh, we can actually see that in the. Uh, we can actually see that in the demo here. So, let's look at this demo. This is the vector of v zero. This is how you initialize the algorithm. One number per state. It's shown in a GUI, but it's just a vector. Uh, one number per state. If I do one iteration, I do a whole bunch of computation, but at the end, I still basically have a vector of zeros because most of the states have reward zero. In this particular version, the living reward is zero. And so only the ones connected to the end really get a non-zero value. And then if I do that again, okay, value two, uh, this after three iterations, four iterations, five iterations. If I keep doing this, uh, nine iterations, here's, um, here's after 100 iterations. Eventually, this is going to converge uh, here to the true values. But uh, I update this vector over and over. And so when I start with zero and I continue kind of to v1, v2, and so on, um, we would like to know that those vk vectors are going somewhere, right? Are we actually going to get, as if k is 100, a million, we don't know how quickly it's going to converge, but we want to know that it will converge. So how do we know? Okay, and actually, without fine print, you don't know. It might not converge. 
So here's the fine print, and that's why there's a star on this slide. One way you might know that the VK vectors are going to converge is if your tree, right, if you unrolled this MDP into a giant Expectamax tree, it might have maximum depth. What would that mean about the game if this, if this game had maximum depth? Yeah, it's a finite game. This game can't go on forever, right? So just like tic-tac-toe can't go on forever, right? Uh, and, uh, some MDPs can't go on forever. And if you know it has a maximum depth, and if you run value iteration, um, if you do enough iterations to reach that depth, then you actually know that you have the right answer. So in that case, it will converge exactly, um, and it'll, you know exactly when it will converge by at worst. The other case, which is the general case, is in fact the MDP is not known to be finite, but you have a discount factor that is strictly less than one. And so remember the discount was motivated on utility theoretic grounds that yes, things in the future actually are worth less to us, but here we're seeing that it actually helps a lot just in terms of making the algorithms work. So if the discount is less than one, then we actually know that the values are gonna converge. How do we know this? Well, here's a sketch of a proof. What are we computing? For each state, we are effectively computing the expectamax value, i.e. what expectamax search would do from that state if you went down k levels in the tree. Okay, we don't actually redo that computation, but we do implicitly compute the exact same number. So vk plus one from, say, the same state is the exact same tree plus one level, right? That's what it means to go k plus one steps down in expectamax instead of k. So you've gone one extra level if you do k plus one rounds rather than k. Well, there's no difference between going k plus one levels in the tree and going k levels and pretending you had gone k plus one levels where the bottom level just had zeros on the rewards, right? If you add in a bunch of zeros, it doesn't change anything. So you can view k and k plus one, right, after k rounds and after k plus one rounds, you can view these vectors as having done the exact same computation, depth k plus one expectamax, except they did them in two different trees. One of the trees has zero at the bottom, and the other tree has some stuff that is actually from the MDP, okay? But you know, what could be down there? There's rewards down here, and these R's, if, you, uh, if the rewards are bounded, they're between some max uh, and some min, okay? So if they're bounded, uh, then we know there's some kind of, there, there's a bunch of stuff down here that's been added in, but remember the discount is one, then gamma, then gamma squared, and so on. And down here, it's gamma to the k, okay, maybe I'm off by one, but down here, it's a gamma to the k. So the rewards only get so big, and as you bury them in the tree, they get multiplied by gamma over and over again. And so the difference between these two trees here, if we've got kind of a on the left and b on the right, the difference between a and b, in terms of their expectamax value, um, it can only be as big as this maximum r times gamma to the k. So they can be at most gamma to the k max r different. And as k increases, max r doesn't grow, but gamma to the k shrinks exponentially fast. And so we know this is gonna eventually converge when we have a discount that's less than one. The smaller the discount, the faster it converges because the less the stuff down here matters when it's heavily discount. Any questions on that? Okay, yep, nope, okay. So that's value iteration, that is the core algorithm. Uh, everything else in some sense is gonna be a variant of it. It is an algorithm for computing optimal values in a dynamic program style layer by layer. Let's watch it in action and maybe see what one of the problems are with this. So one of the problems, if we come back to, I think I want actually, I want this one. Um, Watch not the values, because they will keep changing. Watch the policies. So here's after one step, two steps, three steps. Watch the arrows. Some of the arrows change. But like here, nothing. The values are changing as I go from five to six. The values change, but the policy doesn't. Okay, And this in general will be true, that the policy will occasionally change. You see a little change here, a little change there. All of the numbers are changing, every round of value iteration. But the policy is only occasionally changing, and sometimes it doesn't change at all. Okay, this is one of the things that makes uh, value iteration slow and one of the reasons there are alternate algorithms. I'm gonna sketch uh, one, another of those algorithms called policy iteration, but in general, we're gonna spend some time now thinking about how to evaluate a policy that isn't the optimal one. Okay, so in policy methods, you've got a policy. It's no longer optimal, optimal stuff. Um, somebody's handed you a policy and you wanna think about it. So first we're gonna talk about an algorithm called policy evaluation. You've got your policy and you wanna know how good is it. So you're assigning a grade to your policy. 
So if you thought about expect max trees, the way they naturally work where you max over actions, they give rise to optimal values. Those maxes that are everywhere in the tree mean that the computation that pops out at the root is the optimal value or the expect a max value. And in general, the computation you do here um, involves two kinds of branching factor. It's got a branching factor over actions that's based on the max, and it's got a branching factor over states, which is based on the possible outcomes of your action. Okay, you max over the actions, you get optimal things out. What if I told you you weren't allowed to take the best action? I gave you a policy and, say, and said, you have to do this. You have to do what's written on this map. Okay, well in that case, your tree of futures would look a little bit different. From a state, instead of having all these actions you might take that you would max over, okay, you're an optimizing agent, you like to max, but you've only got one choice. You have to take the policy that uh, is specified. And so your, your expect a max tree, such as it is, is much smaller when I fix the policy. Now from a state, there's only one child, which is the one action you're allowed to take. So basically the max goes away. And now you're stuck with the action recommended by the policy. So if we fix a policy, the tree is simpler, and the branching factor is smaller. We still, if we think about this tree, need to think about all the S's, but the branching factor that came from A is gone. So it's a smaller tree, and that's good, but we don't compute optimal things in this tree anymore because we're not allowed to take maxes. Okay. But let's say we would like to take our fixed policy. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, and we'd like to grade it. So we'd like to figure out what the utilities are for this policy. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna write not v star, uh, which is the optimal value from a state, we're gonna write v pi, which is the value you achieve from that state on average if you follow pi. Is it gonna be better than v star? Definitely not. Is it gonna be equal to v star? Maybe. If the values of all the states are equal to v star, then you've got your hands on an optimal policy. For a generic kind of mediocre policy, the v pi's are gonna be smaller than v star because they're not optimal. So v pi of s is the expected total discounted rewards starting in s and following pi. And it corresponds to an expect a max search where you start in s, but instead of taking a max, you just kind of always do what pi says, but you still consider the average over outcomes because that's, uh, that hasn't gone away. So there's a Bellman equation for this, right? Uh, um, every time you have some notion of an MDP, maybe the policy's fixed, maybe it's not. There's a Bellman equation for that. And in this case, what is the Bellman equation? Well, uh, let's write it out slowly. Um, v pi, this is the value I'm gonna get if I'm in start in state S. Well, what's that gonna be equal to? Well, again, it's a one-step look ahead. So you're gonna get uh, a reward. The reward you get depends on the state you're in, the action you take, and the action you take is now pi of S. You have no choice, it's now pi of S. And it depends, the instantaneous reward depends on the S prime you land in. So the complete score you get is this instantaneous reward that you get for the first step, plus the value you get from the S prime you land in. And since you're following pi, it's the value of S prime for the policy pi. Of course, it's all discounted, right? Um, and we have to take an average over all the S primes. Okay, so there's gonna be a sum over S primes. They're weighted by T. And, um, and that's it. So where'd my max go? It's just like my old Bellman equation, except the max is gone. Max is gone because I don't have a max over actions. I'm stuck with pi of s. So this is really the same Bellman equations uh, with a fixed policy. All right, I'll erase that and make, no. Nope. I'll erase that and make the LaTeX appear. Okay, so this again is a system of equations. How would you solve it? Um, well, we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, here's an example. So let's say somebody gives you, you, let's say your agent is in a grid world where it, you're kind of, you've got a path straight and then there's kind of fire pits to the left and right. And let's say I hand you the action that says in whatever square you're in, uh, you have to go right, unless you're in a, an end square and then you have to choose exit. Okay, is this a good policy? Would you want to follow this policy? Right, policy evaluation lets you look at the policy, look at the MDP and realize that you're gonna uh, experience a fiery death, okay? So that policy isn't very good. We should be able to run policy evaluation and get kind of small numbers out, low, value to, low values to the states. Here's another policy, always go forward. This policy in a grid world is not without risk because you can still slip and go to the left or right, but it's certainly a better policy than the one um, where you always go right. So here we've got two policies. We can evaluate either one. The state value should be higher on the right. And so I ran these through the GUI. Um, here's what you get. For always go right, 
Well, it turns out this policy is not really all that bad if you happen to be in the end state. And really, if you're in a fire pit, you know, what do you want from life? But if you're in the kind of region of the MDP where you've got actual choice, where you're on the bridge, you can see here that you know, it's not actually a very good policy, right? Um, at, if you imagine the bottom state as the start state, it's almost minus 10, because if you kind of maniacally go right, uh, then the only thing that's keeping you from getting a minus 10 is either the discount if you fail to get into the pit quickly, um, or if you accidentally slip your way up to the, the, the 100. So it's not quite as bad as minus 10, but it's pretty bad. On the other hand, if you always go forward, then the state values are higher. So this one on the right happens to be the optimal policy, though you can't prove that just by eyeballing it. Um, and the state values in some cases are the same, but in general are, are higher. So that's a better policy. Okay. All right, so how do we produce these numbers for a fixed policy? Well, it turns out it's actually exactly the same as value iteration, only easier. So I fix my policies, and I can turn my equations into updates. So it's just like value iteration. I start with a vector of values for every state. They start off as zero, so it starts the same as value iteration. The difference is these values are eventually going to become v pi. They're going to become the values under pi, not the values under optimal action. How do we do that? Well, each round of the iteration, OK, each, each uh, round, we visit each s, and we write out the Bellman equation, and we plug in our old approximation on the right, and we get out our new approximation on the left. So what is this thing? Well, we've picked v pi, and we're averaging over the s's that result. So it corresponds to this expectum x tree. And for each s prime that results, we take an instantaneous reward plus a discounted future. So this is the expectum x when you go one level in the future, when you go one step in the future, so you unroll one, one time step, but you fix yourself to pi. And that means that this is if, uh, when this converges, it's going to converge to v pi. Right? If you put the maxes back, you get value iteration, and you'll get v star. OK. Uh, what's the time complexity of this thing? Well, when I'm at s, I don't have a for loop over actions anymore. I just look up my recommended action. But when I'm at this q state, and I have to consider all the s primes that might result, in principle, there could be s of them. Usually, the branching factor is smaller. Usually, states aren't fully connected like this. But every time I update a single state's value, I'm going to have to do a for loop here over s many things. And how many entries are in this vector? Well, there's one value for every state. So there's s many of these uh, updates to do per iteration. So the time it takes to do an iteration is s squared. How many iterations do you need? OK, well, who knows, right? It depends on things like gamma um, and the structure of your MDP. But each iteration here is s squared. If you remember back to Bellman equation, if, sorry, if you remember back to value iteration, do you remember how long each round of value iteration took? It was also s squared, but with an extra factor. What was the extra factor? There was an extra a, because there was a kind of a max of a, which was an extra for loop in your code. right? And so this thing is a factor of a faster than, uh, than doing value iteration. Of course, it gives you something different. So in and of itself, that's not very helpful. But if you have lots of actions, this is much faster. It's much faster to evaluate a single policy, because you don't have to consider all the actions. You only have to do the one that you're told. OK, so that's the efficiency. Um, now, of course, you could also look at these equations. Um, so the equations aren't here, but basically, if you make this an, an equal sign here, if you look at this equation, right, there's t's and there's r's, but those are just numbers. You can look them up. The variables are the v's. So if you look at these equations, they're now linear. The maxes went away. This is a system of linear equations. And there's all kinds of ways to solve them. So you can do this fixed point solution. It's a perfectly good way to solve a big um, uh, set of equations. But you could also just you know, uh, stick it into MATLAB or whatever you would like to do for linear system uh, solution. So any questions on policy evaluation? If I give you an MDP and I give you a policy, you should be able to write some code that evaluates how good that policy is. You might even call it project three. Okay. okay. Now, evaluating policies is fine, right? But in the end, we want to be able to get actions. Now, one way to get actions is to run value iteration. Right? How does value iteration give you actions? I thought it computed Vs. Well, it does. But when you take that max over all of the possible actions, one of them was the best, and that's the one you should take. So that max at the root really actually tells you the action you should take. So what policy extraction is about is this, this kind of weird thing until we connect it all up. Policy extraction says, if I hand you values, right? who knows where they came from? Maybe they're even optimal. I hand you values, how should you compute an action from those values? Right? 
Because if I tell you, hey, guess what? You're in a state that's worth 103. Like, you're like, great, what should I do? Right, we need to be able to compute actions. So let's think about this. So let's imagine somebody gives you the optimal values. And okay, so here's a grid world. Here are the optimal values for this setting of the grid world. I ran it to convergence. Okay, so uh, some states are 0.8, some states are 1.0, and so on. So let's say you're now in this state here that's worth 0.89. And the GUI is showing the optimal action is to go to the uh, go west and kind of bang against the wall. But let's pretend you didn't know that. You only knew 0.89. And I said, here are the optimal values. I promise they're optimal. So you don't have to run value iteration or anything crazy like that. How should you act? Like, who knows, right? Like, you know what you'd like. You'd rather be in this square. You'd rather be at the 0.98. But you don't actually know whether you should get there by bumping into the wall or by trying to go north. So in some sense, the optimal values themselves don't actually help you act. You still need to do some expectamax or something to figure out what you're going to do. Now, they help you do the expectamax. So one thing you could do given optimal values is you could say, all right, that's annoying. I would have rather had an optimal policy. But at least I can use these optimal values to do less expectamax than I would otherwise. So what we could do if we wanted to know how to act is we could do um, a little bit of expectamax search. But it is not obvious straight from the values. So how should we do it? We could do an expectamax search as follows. We could say, all right, I'm in some state s. So let's say we're in, uh, we're in this state here. Um, I'm in some state s, and I would like to know the optimal policy. Or rather, I'd just like to know the policy that these values correspond to. So what should I do? Well, I essentially need to do a little layer of expectamax. So I need to say, well, I need to consider the max over all actions available to me. And for each one, I need to figure out which is best. How do I do that? Well, I need to take an average over the possible results of those actions. I plug in the probability that that action would lead to that result. And then for each possible result, I consider the instantaneous reward plus the discount on my future. Right, gamma in there. We space that gamma in here. And now, OK, this actually kind of helps, right? Because we know this. We don't have to do the recursion anymore. We don't have to run value iteration. I go one level into the future. And suddenly, the optimal values are the thing I need in the equation. So if I need to choose actions, I do need to do one layer of expectamax, but I don't need to do more because once I go one layer in the future, I can just plug in the values I've got. They represent the whole rest of the tree. OK, everybody happy about that? One layer at the root tells you the action. OK, I wrote something that's syntactically ill-formed here. I said policy, which is something like north or west, is a max, right? But a max of a bunch of things, a max of a, max, max of a bunch of real numbers is a real number, right? So I don't actually mean the maximum of these things. I mean the action that corresponds to the maximum, right? Uh, we have a way of writing that. We write argmax, so the maximum argument of some expression. So when you see argmaxes, that's all it means. It's just like a max, except in, instead of returning the number, of se the number 7, we return the value of a which produced the max. Okay, that's a notation that some of you will have seen and some of you will not. Any questions on that? OK, so if I hand you, act if I hand you, um, if I hand you um, values, I have to kind of extract my policy from the values by visiting every state and doing one layer of expectamax. This thing here, this is actually value iteration. This is one layer of value iteration, uh, except it says argmax instead of max. This process where you take values and you turn them with one round of value iteration into a policy is called policy extraction, because it takes the policy that's implied by the values. All right, so it's annoying. Policy extraction is annoying. It's very hard to get actions uh, out or policies out of values. But let's say I gave you Q values. I actually gave you how good each Q state is. And we, you know, we hate Q states because they're confusing, and it's not actually clear why a chance node should even have a name. But suddenly, now we love Q values because they solve our problem for us. So let's go back to that square here. Um, I guess you kind of can't see the ink very well. But OK, so anyway, I mean this square here. Can't see that either. This square. All right, so there's this square here. And if I look and I see all my Q values, when you told me that square was worth 0.89 under optimal action, it wasn't helpful to me because I didn't know what action that corresponded to. 
but when each action has its own expect a max value, now action selection is easy, because I look, and what do I know? I know that if I'm in this state and I choose um, west, I'll get 0.89 if I act optimally thereafter. But if I choose east, I'm going to get minus 0.62. If I choose north, I'm going to get 0.76. And so now action selection is super easy. What do I do? Take a little max. So um, it's totally trivial to select actions from Q values. You just look around at your Q values, and you pick the best one. Okay. So there's a lesson there. Q values may be non-intuitive. right? It's more intuitive to talk about the value of a state. But if you want to do action selection, Q values are the thing you want because they kind of compartmentalize the expect -a max scores by action. That lets you do action selection. And so Q values are going to take a central role when we do uh, reinforcement learning. They're going to be the object we need to learn in the end for exactly this reason. OK, so know, get to know them and love them now. OK, so what have we done so far? We had value iteration, which is kind of this single algorithm that computes optimal values. And along the way, it's kind of constantly computing policies, too. We have an, an algorithm that evaluates policies. I give you a crummy policy. You can tell me exactly how crummy it is. We also have an algorithm that does a one-step look ahead and turns values into a policy. OK, but now we can turn policies into values and values into a policy. And this gives uh, a, a new approach to finding optimal things called value iteration, where you send, sorry, called policy iteration, where you start with a policy that's mediocre and you improve the policy rather than improving the values directly. OK, so um, you've actually already seen this, right? Uh, the demo here is, uh, I'll just show it again for context. The demo here is, um, is that as I go, so value iteration, as I do rounds of value iteration, right, the values all change every round, but the policy often doesn't change. Or even when it changes, it changes in some small localized way. And so there's a problem there. Uh, why is that a problem? Well, one problem with valuation is it's slow, right? Not only do you have to visit each state every, every iteration, and for each state you have to consider each other state uh, because of the non-determinism, but at each state you need to reconsider every action. But that's kind of silly because if the action that's going to be the maximum is almost always the same as the last round, you've wasted all this time checking all the others every time. Maybe you shouldn't check the other actions every round. OK, so that's one reason why we're slow, is because we're rechecking all these actions, even though they rarely change. Um, uh, problem two is that often, when you actually look at it, the policy itself will be finished. And value iteration spends all this time fine-tuning the values that, in fact, you could care less about. All you wanted to know was the policy. And so uh, policy iteration fixes both of these problems. So in policy iteration, we're still going to try to learn optimal values, but we're going to do it in a different way. We're going to alternate between two steps. Step one is called policy evaluation. I hand you a policy like always go right or something like that. You calculate the values, the utilities, for that fixed policy. What are you going to get? You're going to get crummy values because it's a crummy policy. That's OK. That's what's supposed to happen. You evaluate the policy you get. Once you know the values of this, you then do policy improvement by doing an extraction step. You do a one-step look ahead from every state. And in essence, you do a round of value iteration. You do a one-step look ahead, and you say, assuming that these evaluated um, values are optimal, which they're not, I'm going to do a one-step look ahead. So things get a little better, because in this step, you've done a one-step expect a max with a truncation function, which, while not perfect, was at least the best thing you had previously. And you alternate between these two things until it converges. Now, it's less obvious that this will converge, but it will. And it is usually um, uh, substantially faster than value iteration. OK, it's still optimal. optimal. It often converges much faster. All right, here's the algorithm. I'm not going to kind of write out the equations in gory detail um, because uh, uh, they're, they're, they're basically the same thing as the value iteration case. I'll point out the differences, though. So first, we do this policy evaluation step. OK, it looks just like value, value iteration, but no max, right? So over here, there's no max. That means we're doing iterations, 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 but the max is gone, so everything's a factor of A faster. Now, once that's done, although we got to the solution quickly, it was for that fixed policy. So now we do our improvement phase, where we have the sum over S and the max. So this thing is fast. This thing is the same speed as value iteration. But the effect you get is because you do it. So let's call this A, and we'll call this B. 
every time you do A, you kind of tune the values, but you don't let the policy change. Every time you do V, you tune the values and you let the policy change. And since the policy doesn't change very often in value iteration, effectively, um, uh, the A's correspond to value iteration rounds where not much happens, and the B's are then value iterations where the policy gets to change. And so the net effect is you're doing something very much like value iteration, but you're locking down the policy for most iterations, and that means things are usually uh, substantially faster. Okay, okay so um, I'm gonna take a step back, then we're gonna take a break and look at something new. Um, to take a step back, we now have two algorithms, actually, We've actually got more, right? We have value iteration, we have policy evaluation, we have policy extraction or improvement, and then we've got policy iteration. And if by now you're thinking values, policies, iterations, evaluations, Vs, Qs, and it's all swimming, uh, that's good, right? The reason these things are all, they all look the same is because they are all the same, right? There's just a bunch of orthogonal stuff where every combination makes sense. Okay, so um, we have these two algorithms, but really they're kind of the exact same thing. Okay, in value iteration, these are the only differences really. Every iteration, you update your values and implicitly the policy, because every time you take a max over actions, if you write down the argument that achieved the max, that's your policy. So every iteration updates everything. You don't track the policy, but it's in there implicitly. In policy iteration, you separate things explicitly. You do some passes that update the values, but don't allow the um, actions to be rechecked, okay? And then every now and then you do a standard value iteration, except now it's called policy improvement, where you allow the values to, the uh, actions to change as well. The new policy is actually guaranteed to be better or the same. If it's the same, then you know you've converged. And if it's better, then you know you will eventually converge because there's finitely many policies and you're eventually gonna run out. Okay, so that's the difference. Um, these are both dynamic programs. They both use the same Bellman equations. And when you look at these Bellman equations and they all look very similar, really it's just there's Vs and their Qs, right? Vs are for states, they're values of states. Qs are values for the chance nodes, okay? Separately, you can compute a value for a fixed policy pi where you don't consider all of the actions, or you can compute an optimal value where you do. So V star versus V pi, it's just about whether or not the max over A is gonna be present. So even though all of these equations are gonna look very similar, um, eventually you'll get to the point where um, this kind of similarity is a feature, but at the beginning it's kind of a bug. And so um, just kind of make sure that whenever you're not sure which variant we're talking about, to ask. Okay, any questions to here before we change gears? Okay, so um, I'm gonna summarize this, then we'll move to something else. If you want to compute optimal values, you have two algorithms. One's called value iteration, one's called policy iteration. They basically do the same thing. Um, if you want to compute values for a particular policy, we have an algorithm called policy evaluation, right? Um, if you want to turn your values into a policy, we have this one step look ahead expect a max that's called policy extraction. Okay, very similar things. And as I said, the reason they look the same is because they recycle the same idea of a one step look ahead and then expect a max tree. Okay, let's take a break. Um, and then we're gonna start uh, exploring the ideas in reinforcement learning. So uh, we've got a little more time today, so let's do maybe a kind of four or five minute break. Okay, now for something completely different. Um, we're gonna talk about the CS188 Casino. Um, the idea here is to start thinking a little bit about the difference between an MDP in which you, um, you aren't sure what the actions of the states will be, sorry, you're not sure what the results of your actions will be, but you are kind of sure what the distribution is. You know the MDP, it's just a non-deterministic thing. That's different from real life when you walk into a casino and you don't know the payoffs and you have to experiment. And so we're gonna do a little bit of kind of a thought experiment here about what's the difference between solving something that is known but non-deterministic versus discovering the parameters on the basis of experimentation. So let's think about um, a casino where there are two possible slot machines you can play. The blue slot machine, every time you play, it returns a dollar. Okay, so that's a reasonable slot machine. If it costs nothing to play, this would be great. You just sit there and get rich, right? Um, the other slot machine is double or nothing, and so you can imagine that sometimes it gives you zero and sometimes it gives you two. All right, which one should you play? 
it depends on how likely you are to get the two versus the zero. If you almost always get the two, you should play the red one. If you almost always get the zero, you should play the blue one. Okay, so these examples are actually really simple, but we can formulate them as an MDP. So here's the MDP that corresponds to playing in this casino, right? And this MDP looks nothing like Grid World. It's a little bit more like the car racing. So there are two actions, blue and red. Blue means you pull the blue lever, right, and you get your guaranteed dollar. Red means you pull the red lever, and in this case, you can see in the numbers, 75% of the time you get $2, but 25% of the time you get zero. So there are uh, two actions, blue and red, and there's two states. You might wonder why there are two states. There's really just one state. You're always ready to play again. Um, but we're gonna formulate this as uh, there being a win state and a lose state. So when you do the blue action, you always win. You happen to win a dollar, but you always end up in the win state. When you pull the red action, um, when you win, you end up uh, getting your $2 and going to W. When you lose, you end up getting your $0 and going to L. The reason why we separate win and loss into two different states is because our formalism of MDPs says the rewards have to depend on the state, the action, and the result state. And win and loss have, uh, with the red action need to differ somehow. And we, differ, we make them differ by uh, changing the landing state. So it's kind of artificial why there's two states, and it's not that important. But that's why there's two states here. All right. So let's imagine there's no discount. Dollars are, in fact, your utility. So we're not going to worry about the utility of the money or anything like that. You have 100 time steps to play. Um, and OK, we kind of know that the state's win and loss are the same. They're kind of a formal construct. OK, so how should you play? What action should you take from the state W? Red or blue? You should take red. What about from L? You should take red. So you should always play red. Great. Um, now, you know, looking at this MDP, you know you should always take red. When you actually play, you don't know whether you're going to win or not, right? But you know that the optimal action is red. OK, so we can solve this MDP. It's totally trivial. You can do it in your head. But the point is, when you solve this MDP, you looked at the 0 .5, 0 0.25, and you looked at the 1, and you looked at the 2, and you looked at all these numbers, and you did some computation. You didn't need value iteration to do it. It's simple enough. You can do it in your head kind of intuitively. But you did look at all the numbers. You did some computation. And suddenly, you knew the values. You knew that over 100 time steps, playing red, uh, that's going to give you, if, if you always uh, play red, you would, you would get 150. If you always play blue, you would get 100. You know that the better policy here is one that plays red. You could do an expect -a max search. It doesn't really matter. In this case, you can intuit the answer. And the answer is, from each state, the policy that's optimal is to play red. All right, so you solve this MDP. You did it on the basis of these numbers, which is your model of the MDP, and you didn't have to play the slots to figure out the answer. You can now take your answer and go make some money, but you didn't have to walk into the casino to figure, out, figure it out, right? You just needed to know the parameters of the MDP. Everybody with me? So that was offline planning. So now you actually go to the casino and it's time to play. Right, and we know you should play the red one, so we're going to play the red one. And what do you get back? OK, it's random, right? $2. OK, uh, you play again. $2. What do you want to play now? Still the red one, right? Nothing's changed. We just have more, more dollars. OK, but now we got zero. Should we change to the blue one now? No, we know that red is optimal, so we're going to keep red, 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 red. Um, and OK, we got some unlucky run at the end. So we can look at this and we say we played 10 times, and what was our average return in terms of uh, dollars? Our average return here is $1.2. What was it supposed to be? It's supposed to be $1.50. Well, were we irrational? Were we suboptimal? Right? Did we miscompute? What, what happened here? Yeah, we, we were unlucky, right? We didn't quite, you know, this particular time playing, we didn't uh, achieve the average. That's fine, because if we play again, maybe we'll do better. The average is the average. So when you actually play, you're not sure what's going to happen, right? You could get straight zeros, right? You just know it's rational, right? When you talk about a policy being optimal, it's rational in the expected sense. The expected utility is highest, and you know that because you know all the numbers that are involved. Okay. So that's online. That, so that's offline planning. What about online? What if you walk into the casino and I don't tell you the payoff matrix? So still you know that the, the, bl the blue one always pays off a dollar, and you still you know that the red one is zero or two, but you don't know the probabilities. OK, so the rules are different. Red has some win chance, but you don't know it. Can you now compute the optimal action? Right? No, it depends on what's under the question mark. 
you can't offline actually figure out what to do. How would I act? So if I actually have to spend some time and money in this casino, how should I act, given that I can't solve the MDP in my head anymore? What do I do? Like, I walk in and I like start pulling levers and see what happens, okay? So let's do it. Okay, which machine should I play? Why shouldn't I play the blue one? You know what it's gonna do, right? If you play the blue one now, then one time step from now, you're gonna be exactly in the same knowledge situation as before, and then if blue's right now, it's gonna be right then, and that's more or less play blue forever. And you probably don't wanna play blue forever, or at least not at this point. Okay, so we're gonna play red, because we learned something. All right, zero. Bet you wish you played blue, right? Um, but that was okay, right? Was, was, was playing red, like, irrational? Was it the wrong thing? It was the right thing, we just, you know, we got a zero. That's, uh, we knew that when we, we played it that we might. So what should we do now? Should we switch to the blue? Probably not, right? Uh, we've got zero again. What should I play now? How about red again? Zero. Okay, what should I play now? Red. Okay, two. Now what? Red. Zero. Now what? Red. Are you ever going to give up on red here? Okay, we play red a bunch of times. Okay, after 10 rounds, uh, now what should I play? Maybe, st maybe still red. If I, was gonna, if I had to play forever, I might want to be a little more sure than this. But if I'm only playing for 100 rounds, like, okay, you know, maybe this was unlucky, but probably we should switch. Okay, so, so here's the important distinction, right? When you played the red one, why did you do it? You didn't do it because you knew it was going to give you higher average returns, right? You did it for what? For information, you did it for science, right? You did it to learn something. <laughs> so um, already, we've actually experienced everything there is to know about reinforcement learning, which we'll start to formalize next time. Okay, so first of all, crucial difference. When I gave you all the numbers, and you computed the average values, and you said, okay, I'm ready to go to the casino, my plan is to play red, that was planning, right? It wasn't interesting planning, but you took a problem, an MDP in this case, you did the appropriate probabilistic computation, and you came up with a policy, which was a boring policy, but it, you, you knew it was the optimal policy. What we just did wasn't planning, it was learning, okay? What you did is you went and you actually interacted with the world, okay? It was a PowerPoint slide, but the point was, you didn't know that the red machine was bad until you tried it a bunch of times. That's not planning, it's learning, right? You had to experiment and so on. In particular, what you did was called reinforcement learning. So, uh, formally, there was an MDP, and you knew it. You knew that that red machine was an MDP. You even kind of knew its connectivity structure. But you couldn't solve the MDP, and the reason you couldn't solve it is because you didn't know which MDP it was. And the thing you didn't know is you didn't know the relative probabilities of payoff for the red uh, machine. So you had to act to figure it out. You had to actually lose real money in order to, to learn that in this case the red one probably wasn't as good. Okay, so there's a bunch of important ideas. Okay, first of all, um, you, uh, you saw exploration, right? You, you have to try unknown actions. You needed to try the red one. You didn't know what it was gonna do, and it turned out actually to be bad, but you didn't know that. And so optimally acting does sometimes mean trying things out that turn out to be bad, right? You don't try them out knowing they're bad, but some of the things you try will turn out to be bad. So exploration um, is when you take an action for science so that you learn and get information back not because of the reward you expect to get. You don't know what you're gonna get in that case. Exploitation is what happened when you eventually decided to give up on the red uh, machine. Because, okay, you know, we don't exactly know how bad it is, but we know it's bad. And at some point you wanna just stop throwing money and figuring out, towards figuring out exactly how bad it is, assuming you're not gonna play it forever. Okay, so exploitation is when you take what you know so far, even though you're aware it might be slightly wrong, and you do kind of the greedy thing according to that. So once you say, oh, I don't actually know, in fact, the red one may actually be terrific, but as far as I know it's worse, I'm never gonna play it again. That's exploitation. And there's a continuum here. You always wanna do some exploration so you learn, and you always wanna exploit so that you actually manage to take advantage of what you've learned. And there's a, kind of a, a smooth blend of these things we're gonna want from optimal behavior. There's another concept called regret that you've learned, okay? Uh, what's regret? Okay, obviously you all know what regret is uh, in, in the real world. What is regret formally? Okay, regret is those zeros, right? So what regret is formally is the difference between what you got when you did all your exploring and learning and so on 
and what you would have gotten if you had acted optimally in the first place. So the optimal thing to do if you had somehow known uh, would be to just play the blue one. You did worse than that, kind of for science, and uh, the difference is regret. So what you'd like is you'd like to eventually be optimal, but you'd like to lose as little money in the process as you explore, and so that's about not eventual optimality, but the regret you incur along the way, okay, in some formal sense. You also saw that there's something about sampling. Because it's chance, you can't just kind of play once. You can't just try the route and be like, oh, zero, right? Who knows, right? Z you could have been lucky, you could have been unlucky. You have to kind of try over and over again until you have enough samples in order to be able to say something confidently. So suddenly all that stuff you know about uh, kind of random sampling and confidence and things like that, all of that has to be relevant to your decision making, right? You need to get enough data, but at some point you should give up and stop uh, even before you're certain. And then the final thing you learned is that this tiny, trivial little MDP which had, had two states, it really only has one state. We were kind of forced to give it two states because of our notation, um, which you could solve in your head instantly if I gave you the numbers. As soon as I say we don't know um, the, the single probability, I, I take one number and I hide it from you, suddenly there's this difficult question of how long you explore and how confident are you and when should you give up and what does it have to do with how long you're going to play? So even the kind of most trivial MDP becomes very hard to solve uh, when you don't know the parameters. So reinforcement learning is much, much harder formally than solving an MDP. So things are much more difficult there. Any questions about what just happened? Okay, so starting next class, um, we're going to look at reinforcement learning. We're going to end a little bit early today. Um, starting next class, we're going to look at reinforcement learning, and we're going to look at, in general, how should you act when there is an MDP, but you don't know the transition and reward function, and so you need to take actions in the real world. Okay, we'll pick that up next time.